The next question is about Anwar al-Awlaki. Should we listen to his talks about uh, the seerah and other things, even though he has the opinion that you can use mass destruction weapons and kill them? As much as, as many people as possible in the West. It's a bit awkward talking about specific people because people get very emotional. Anwar al Awlaki was somebody who Allah Azza wa Jal blessed with a good tongue and he had some, some basic knowledge of Islam. And in America, that basic knowledge is very useful. And before 9 11, he did a lot of good work. Before 9 11, he did a lot of good work. And he did a lot of good lectures about the seerah, about the lives of the Prophet. And Allah Azza wa Jal blessed him with a personality that really the people and the youth loved. Uh, and I was, of course, I mean, active in da'wah when he was active. I, I knew him, I met him. Uh, we had some type of cordial relationship. Then, after 9 11, uh, he released a number of statements which condemned 9 11 and condemned America. And he followed a path that you still see me upon, which is you criticize America for its foreign policy and you criticize the militants for the militancy. This is my methodology, I'm still upon it. You criticize America for their foreign policy and you say America has killed more people through its foreign policy than all the jihadists combined. I'm an American, I'm saying this. Listen to me carefully. American foreign policy has killed far more people than the jihadists have killed. That doesn't make the jihadist methodology right. This is what Anwar al-Awlaki himself said. You will find it on YouTube. Same types of stuff. That methodology, I'm still upon it. Then what happened? Slowly but surely, he began veering away from this methodology. And he began to feel that it is legitimate to attack all American citizens. Any American citizen becomes a legitimate target. Eventually he left America and he moved to Yemen and he became more uh, incendiary and more militant. And this is when I disagreed with him. I began to indirectly refute him, not directly. I never wanted to mention him by name. I was hoping and making dua and praying that he would come back to a more moderate path, especially because he had lived in America for I think 15 years or something, 10 years, and he had seen that, look, the average American is totally ignorant of foreign policy to this day. This is the biggest problem of jihadists, that they think every American is, mashallah, tabarakallah, complete expert in everything. Ya akhi, the average American doesn't even know where Norway is, with all respect to Norway. If you showed them on a map, where is Norway? They would have no idea, completely. This is the system of America. They don't know. You're just going to go kill them because of American foreign policy? No, this is not Islam. It's not logical. It's not rational. But this is what he began saying. And he began preaching something that I did not agree with. I began refuting him indirectly. And when uh, America assassinated him in a cruel, unjust assassination that goes against everything it stands for itself, for those of you who are into political science and history and whatnot, the right of habeas corpus is what makes the West the West. The right of habeas corpus, you're not going to kill somebody, try somebody, jail somebody without a trial, without a jury, without evidence being presented. This is the cornerstone of Western civilization. Well, when, whenever it suits them, they'll throw it out the window and they did it for Anwar al-Awlaki. When they assassinated Anwar al-Awlaki by an executional decree, by the president himself, he just willed it and he just said, go and kill him. When they did this, I was the one who wrote an op-ed in the New York Times and I'm not trying to brag or boast brothers and sisters, but sometimes things need to be said. The only national cleric in America that came out and criticized, and in the New York Times, which is the most prestigious publication in all of America, the next day after Anwar al-Awlaki is assassinated, I wrote a New York Times op-ed, Google it, Yasir Qadhi, New York Times op-ed, Anwar al-Awlaki, you will find it. And I wrote an unjust, and a illegal and a counterproductive, unjust, illegal, counterproductive assassination. And I criticized Anwar al-Awlaki, but then I said, what do you think you guys have done? By assassinating him, you have done exactly what you accuse them of doing, which is killing indiscriminately, which is killing people that are, that are without judge and jury and trial. And the lines between you and the enemy are becoming blurred now. You're doing the same tactics that you criticize. And what have you done? You have made Anwar al-Awlaki into a, into a person who will be admired. His thought will be admired. Look, my dear brothers and sisters, we do not pronounce verdicts on people. What is his fate in the Akhirah? That's not my business to judge. Allah I will judge. I will judge the legacy he left behind. And that legacy has much good and it also has much harm. That legacy has much good and it also has potential danger. I do not believe in his methodology of jihad. And I think that he 
misunderstood. He was, now Allah knows best, some people have told me he was tortured in Yemen and that torture caused him to react in a manner. Whatever, Allah will answer, he will answer to Allah on the day of judgment. I'm not talking about his akhirah. Whether he died a shaheed or not, we hope every good Muslim dies the death of a shaheed. That's not my business to judge. My business is to judge his legacy. And his legacy has a lot of good and also a lot of harm and danger. So, should you listen to him? If you want to take the good only and you're qualified to take the good, fine. But be careful that his methodology of jihad, in my humble opinion, it goes exactly in sync with my entire lecture. It sounds so good, but what good will it do you? What good will it do you? And here's another point, brothers and sisters. Our religion doesn't tell us to die foolish deaths. Our religion does not tell us to charge into battle, a legitimate battle, and throw off your armor and say, come and kill me, I want to die shaheed. Do you think that's how the Sahaba fought? Think about it. Do you think that's how the Sahaba fought? Yes, we want to die a shaheed, a legitimate martyr, but that's after we fought a real war, a legitimate war. You cannot fight a real war doing what he did, speaking as he spoke. You are asking for trouble that will not bring about any positive to the ummah. And subhanAllah, the brother Anwar did so much good when he was preaching and teaching. How many youth came back to Islam? Wallahi, think about it now. Be calm, be fair. His message that he died with, how has it tainted all of that good? Before anybody else was giving da'wah to that level, I was in Medina, others were in Medina. In the late 90s, the most effective preacher in all of America to bring the masses back to Islam was, alhamdulillah, somebody like Anwar, doing so great work. What did his late legacy do to his earlier legacy? Think about it. Imagine if he had stayed on that same path. Imagine if he kept on telling the youth, come back to the masjid, come back to Allah, pray, leave your sins, don't do this, don't do that. How much more benefit could he have benefited the ummah? Now as it is, ask yourselves, what has he done of benefit in legacy? As for his akhirah, I say again, that's between him and Allah, that's not my business to judge. But in this dunya, I have to say that I disagree with that methodology. I think it is harmful for him, and it proved to be harmful for him, and it is harmful to the ummah. It is counterproductive to the ummah. Who will benefit? You know, Anwar wasn't the only one who died. There were other Americans who were killed in drone attacks. One of them was with him. And that brother that died with him, uh, Samir Khan is his name. So I, uh, I also had online interaction with him and a lot of back and forth. And he would refute me as being, oh, you're a pacifist, you're a sellout, you're this, you're that. And wallahi, it hurt me back then. Wallahi, it hurt me that this brother has so much zeal, but he's misusing it. Now, where is this brother? What has he done? What good has he done for the ummah? What he could have remained. I, would, I visited his community last year and his family is grieving, his mother is sad, his brothers are this and that. My point is what good has been accomplished? A young, vibrant, dynamic man has been extinguished. Nothing left of him. What, what could he have done for the ummah? Now there's nothing left. Our ummah, our religion, our Lord, our Prophet وسلم, is not telling you to die the death of a fool. Live your life productively. You know, Sheikh bin Baz had a beautiful saying. He said, it's easy to die the death of a, 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 a shaheed. It's difficult to live the life of a shaheed. Meaning what? You walk into a battle, it's easy to die. You're living and you live like the shaheed. You live like a Muslim. That is the real battle. Brothers and sisters, what good did they do? What, with all respect to them, what good did they do? So don't follow that path and let Allah be their judge. And realize that the ummah needs every one of you to be proactive and productive uh, in, in doing what you are doing right now, which is being good Muslims, giving back to your communities, spreading the teachings of Islam. This is what the ummah needs of you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <laughs> الصوارم كي تسترد المظالم حتى الأراضي نسام رسول أهل العزائم القول قول الصوارم كي تسترد المظالم حتى الأراضي نسام رسول أهل العزائم ما دنسوا لي حمانا لو طوقته الضراغم حسالة البغي صالت فأين عهد الحواسم ناسوا بأننا أبات نذود ذود القشاعم نحن الذين وطئنا بالقوم